Hello, welcome back to Intro to Biology for Majors, or Bio 1224. Uh, today we're going to cover Chapter 3, which is still Module 1. Um, this is the OpenStax book, Biology 2E, and the chapter is called Macromolecules. So let's start off with our objectives. We're going to have three for this chapter. The first being identify the four major molecules of life. The second is identify appropriate monomers and polymers. And the third is being able to identify the function of the four major molecules of life that we're going to cover. So cells contain four major types of molecules. Those molecules are the carbohydrate, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acid. And carbohydrates, so right here, nucleic acids over here and proteins all contain multiple different types of what we call monomers, which are these individual parts making up the larger structure. And we're going to talk more about monomers in the next few slides. Um, this uh, composition and sequence is very important to their function. So the three of them being carbohydrate, protein, nucleic acid, and then lipids make up the remaining class of macromolecules. But as you can see, it's not made up of individual monomers um, as the other three are. So this slide sort of digs more into information that we really uh, dug into in the last couple of chapters. Um, it's titled Atoms Form Molecules. And there's a video link here if you want to dig more into this. It's called The Science of Macaroni Salad, What's in a Molecule? It kind of talks about the molecules that you're gonna find in the different foods that you eat. Um, so foods such as bread, fruit, and cheese are rich sources of macromolecules. Foods contain the primary elements that we talked about in the last chapter, which was the acronym CHOMPS, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Um, so denaturation can also be due to heat, pH, or other factors, which is something else we talked about in the last chapter. Since structure determines function in all of these macromolecules, Proteins must be folded properly to work. So you have certain proteins that all are found within the same molecules, but they're folded a very specific way. So the shape really matters. The function is all determined by the structure. So all four biological macromolecules contain CHO, so carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Remember, the six most common elements in biology are CHONPS, the CHOMPS macromolecule, or the CHOMPS acronym that we've spoken about before. So let's talk about dietary sources, all the foods that we eat and what's found in them. So carbohydrates are mostly found in fruits, vegetables, grains, pasta, bread, and other foods. Lipids are found in oils, butter, cheese, beef, pork, and other foods. Protein are found in beef, fish, eggs, dairy, poultry, and other foods, and nucleic acid is found in the cells of plants and animals. So carbs include things called polysaturides. So we've talked about monosaturides. These are polysaturides, which we'll talk a little bit more about in the next few slides. But these proteins are found in meat and dairy products. Lipids include saturated and unsaturated fats like butter and oils. Um, DNA is found in the nucleus of plant and animal cells. So whenever you see nucleic acid, you can think DNA, and that's found in the nucleus of plant and animal cells. If there are only single bonds between neighboring carbons in the hydrocarbon chain, a fatty acid is said to be saturated. These are solid at room temperature, so something like butter. When the hydrocarbon chain has a double bond, the fatty acid is said to be unsaturated as it now has fewer hydrogens. So these are liquid at room temperature, like oils. So we've already been talking about monomers and polymers, but we haven't really dug into what they are. So that's what this slide is for. There's another video link here just called Biomolecules, and it's a YouTube video if you're interested. A monomer is a single unit of a carbohydrate, protein, or nucleic acid. So remember the images that I showed you a couple slides back? Um, those are good examples of this. There are single units within a carbohydrate, a protein, or a nucleic acid called monomers, and they join to form polymers. So dehydration synthesis is a process that joins two monomers or two single parts to form a polymer or something with multiple parts. And then hydrolysis separates polymers, something with multiple parts, into monomers. So basically, dehydration synthesis adds thing to get, add things together. Hydrolysis separates them. So you can think of adding and subtracting. Um, so look at these images here at the bottom, little diagrams. This is just a good little 
key of what I'm talking about. So you have a monomer, which is a single unit, and then you have a polymer, which is multiple monomers chained together here. So monomer is a general term for any molecule joining to form a larger molecule. And we talked about monosaturides in the previous slide and the ones before that. Um, monosaturides are monomers. Disaturides are two joined monomer units, which makes sense because di stands for two. And polysaturides are long chains, like starch is an example. And poly stands for multiple. So whenever we're saying mono, think one, di, think two, and poly, think multiple. So large biological molecules often assemble via dehydration synthesis reactions. So that's what we talked about in our slide right here. Dehydration synthesis um, joins monomers forming polymers. So monomers will form um, covalent bonds to other monomers and they make a growing chain and they release a water molecule in the process. That's actually how it works. And I'll kind of show you that in the next slide. And then glucose is a very important monosaturide with six carbons and a chemical formula of C6H12O6. So that means that glucose has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. It's often drawn as a hexagon. So our next slide is gonna really kind of dig into that a little bit more. And this is really the chemistry behind biological concepts. So bear with me and just pay attention as well as you can to the next slide. Um, it's really important to understand the processes of dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So first let's talk about dehydration synthesis in depth here. So don't be intimidated by these images. I promise I'm gonna explain this the best that I can. But in a previous slideshow, we talked about these biological chemical equations. Um, so we talked about how the reactants are on the left side and the products are on the right. So I like to think of it just like I would think of a math problem. This plus this equals, which is what I use that little arrow to show you, this thing. So in dehydration synthesis, like I said in the last slide, we are adding something together to make something new. In hydrolysis, we're actually taking this same object here, this new polysaturide, and we're breaking it down into two separate parts. So they're literally just the opposite of one another. Dehydration synthesis forms and hydrolysis breaks apart. So monomers join to another by dehydration synthesis is what we're looking at here. This is a chemical reaction. A molecule of water is one of the products. So it's one of the products that comes out of the process of dehydration synthesis. And this little red H2O here is what we're talking about. This is a dehydration synthesis reaction because water is removed during the reaction. So that's always gonna be found as a product. So if you look here, this is actually the glucose molecules that we were talking about previously. So we're taking them and forming a larger product. So hydrolysis then takes the reactants as that larger product here and we're going to still have that hydrogen and two oxygens, which is our water, and we're gonna equal two separate parts. So we're breaking it apart now rather than building it up. So it's the complete opposite of dehydration synthesis. So polymers right here break down into two separate monomers, one being this one, one being this one. And it's kind of nice because it will show you on both hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis where those water uh, molecules originally came from. So in dehydration synthesis, we have OH and then an H here. So that would be H and H is H2, and then you have your O. So that's how you have this extra water here. And on this side, we have our um, polymer on this side that is broken down into our monomers. It looks the exact same as dehydration synthesis, almost as if this were a mirror and you're just looking at two sides of a different coin, right? So it's just the opposite of this. So Dehydration synthesis adds together, hydrolysis takes things apart, okay? So that's really important to understand the difference between the two. And in this process, water is a reactant. So in dehydration synthesis, water is a product. In hydrolysis, water is a reactant. It's on the left side, okay? So if you have any further questions, please reach out because I know this is sometimes confusing for people who haven't taken a lot of chemistry. Um, it's really not that hard. Um, I'd be happy to break this down for you all more through email or anything that you need. So please reach out. So I really wanna 
go deeper into the four types of molecules that we talked about previously, and I want to start with carbs or carbohydrates. So carbohydrates include things like simple sugars and polysaturides. Monosaturides are the monomers of carbohydrates, which we already said. Polysaturides are long chains of carbohydrates that act as fuel for our body. Cellulose is actually the plant structure molecule. So cellulose is what gives plants their structure. And um, glucose is the most common carbohydrate. So I have a little example of just different aspects of this slide here. So you have a monosaturide of glucose. You have a disaturide of glucose, which we said mono is one, right? Di is two. And then here we have a polysaturide. And this example has four. You could have more or maybe one less. Um, but yeah, this is just three different examples of what we previously talked about. So carbohydrates consist of only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These are present in a one to one ratio. So that would mean one carbon, two hydrogen, one oxygen. Um, glucose is the most common carbohydrate, like we said previously. Okay, so now let's talk about lipids. Lipids are hydrophobic and they're energy rich. So when we say hydrophobic, we mean water hating, right? They don't dissolve in water. When you say something is hydrophilic, it means that it likes water, it does dissolve. But lipids are like oil, so they are hydrophobic and energy rich. And the function of lipids is to store energy. And that's something you really need to remember. Lipids store energy. They are not soluble in water, so they don't break down easily in water. They form membranes. And then this is another thing. One calorie is the amount of heat that's required to raise a gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's a measure of the energy stored in food. So that's a way that you measure the energy that we store within our food. And the basic function of lipids is to store energy. So that's kind of an important little mathematical thing for you to know is that one calorie is the amount of heat that it requires to raise a gram of water by one degree Celsius. So unsaturated fats are liquids at room temperature, example being olive oil, and they typically come from plants or fish. And lipids are a very big part of the keto diet. So some notes that I have are that lipids, again, are hydrophobic. They do not dissolve in water. The function is, again, to store energy. Um, one gram of fat actually stores more than twice the energy of a gram of carbohydrate. This makes fatty foods very high in calories. So uh, saturated fats are actually solids at room temperature. So an example being butter, and they typically come from animals. And once again, unsaturated fats are li liquids at room temperature, example being olive oil, and they typically come from plants or fish. Okay, so now let's talk about proteins. And there will be a subsequent slide after this that talks more about protein folding, because if you remember, we talked about how important it is that proteins are folded correctly to perform different functions in our body. So proteins have more variable structures and functions than any of the other organic molecules, because there are so many ways that our bodies utilize proteins by folding them so that they can perform very specific duties in our body um, in very specific places. So they do all the work and that's important to know that the job of proteins is doing all the work they are the worker bees of our bodies they are the most abundant organic molecule they are also the most diverse because of all of the ways that our body folds them to do work in our body um they may be structural regulatory contractile or protective which we'll kind of talk more about but they just have a multitude of different um, options of what they can do for us in our body and they may serve as transport, they may store things, um, membranes, or they may be uh, toxins or enzymes. And proteins are important for the paleo diet. So if you're on the paleo diet, they're mostly looking at the proteins that you're taking in. So some of the points and notes that I wanna hit are once again, that proteins are the most abundant organic molecule. They're the most diverse organic molecule. They may be either structural, regulatory, contractile, or protective. Um, they are all polymers of amino acids arranged in a linear sequence. Um, again, the paleo diet is what we focus on with proteins. So enzymes speed up reactions and can be used over and over again. Um, there are 20 types of amino acids uh, and their order in a protein determines the shape that the protein takes and what its job will be. So we'll kind of cover that in the next slide. 
but there are once again 20 different types of amino acids and their order in a protein determines the shape that protein will take and that the protein takes on a specific job and it kind of tells that protein what job to do. Amino acids assemble to form polypeptides. The bonds holding one to another are called peptide bonds. So these amino acids that are formed, they make polypeptides and the bonds between those amino acids are called peptide bonds. So amino acids are monomers joined together by these polypeptide bonds through dehydration synthesis. So we said in the other slides about dehydration synthesis that it brings monomers together to form polymers, right? So it would in this case bring amino acids together joined to form polypeptides, which is the, the reaction and the reactant and the product um, through dehydration synthesis. Okay, so this is that subsequent slide I talked about, about protein folding. And um, there's an image here that just kind of shows you an unfolded protein um, on the left side, completely unfolded. So you have kind of red, white, and blue to distinguish the different parts or the, the full length of this protein. And it's being what looks like crumpled up, but it's actually very um, specific in its folding measures. So it wants to do a certain job. It's going to fold a very specific way. So a polypeptide must properly fold into a protein or it cannot do its job. The monomers of these proteins, like I mentioned in the last part of the last slide, are called amino acids. And all amino acids have the same general structure and most enzymes that we have in our bodies are proteins. And like I said in that last slide, enzymes, proteins do all the work, right? Enzymes can actually jumpstart reactions in our body. So proteins are composed of amino acid polymers that are bound together by what we call peptide bonds, like beads on a string. The electron interaction of the amino acids gives proteins the most complex 3D shape, which we can see here, and its final shape, folded, is vital to its function. Okay, so now let's talk about nucleic acid monomers. So this is gonna be the last of the four molecules that we've talked a lot about in this chapter. And this slide and my notes have a lot of information, so just bear with me. Um, so again, we're talking about nucleic acids and they include DNA and RNA, which I'm sure you've heard of both of those things. We hear a lot more about DNA in general, but with COVID, we've heard a lot about RNA. Um, these molecules contain genetic information. So the monomers of nucleic acids are called nucleotides. So there are actually five types of nucleotide and DNA and RNA both have adenine, cytosine, and guanine, but DNA uses something called thymine and RNA uses something called uracil. So in RNA, there is no thymine and in DNA, there is no uracil. So those are both, both specific to either DNA or RNA. So let's look at these images we have on the right side. DNA is right here. Um, we know what this looks like. This is a double helix. And um, these bars that are connected in the middle of the double helix are those nucleotides and they come together in base pairs. And in DNA, adenine binds to thymine, so A binds to T, and guanine, G, binds to C, cytosine. That's how it's always worked. Um, you probably learned about that in high school. Um, so each nucleotide in DNA contains one of four possible nitrogenous bases. Um, so that it contains either adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine. A and T bind and C and G bind to form a double helix, which is this image we see here. So DNA always stays in the nucleus except for during cell division when the nucleus actually dissolves. DNA stores all of the information necessary to make cell parts and to run the cell. And nucleotides join in a double chain or a double helix to form DNA. Uh, the sequence in uh, the sequence of bases, A, T, G, and C, and how they uh, work up in that DNA strand uh, make up the genetic code. So now let's talk a little bit more about RNA. So RNA on the left side here, if you see, it's just a single strand. Rather than a double helix, RNA is just one half of that. So it has several subtypes that help deliver instructions for making proteins, um, deliver amino acids for making proteins, and uh, it activates ribosomes. So in RNA, nucleotides actually join in a single chain. And in RNA, there is no thymine. It contains something called uracil, which takes the place of thymine. So in RNA, um, thymine is not 
shown at all. It just has you, you're a sill. Um, so uh, most large biological molecules are polymers, which we've talked about a lot. They are long chains made up of repeating molecular units or what we call building blocks or monomers. If you think of a monomer as being a bead on a string, you can think of a polymer as being a necklace with a subsequent series of beads all strung together. So the monomer for a protein is an amino acid, like we said in the last slide, and the monomer for DNA is the nucleic acid. Okay, so with that, we've reached the end of this slideshow, um, and we have our key takeaways as usual. So our key takeaways here are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acid are the four molecules of life. Monomers join by dehydration synthesis to form polymers, which can be broken down by hydrolysis. So like we said, those are the opposite of one another. They're two sides of the same coin. So dehydration synthesis forms polymers, and um, hydrolysis breaks polymers down into monomers again. So the last key takeaway is that carbohydrates fuel Lipids form compartments, proteins do the work, and nucleic acid hold the instructions for building proteins. So that last takeaway really tells you what each of the four of these molecules job is. So that's really important to know as well. And I will see you guys in the next one. If you have any questions about any of this, please follow up with me over email. Um, you can find that on your Blackboard site.